so first, a mandatory sponsor slide. I guess I already talked about this in an earlier talk. So you know, just thank you very much for those folks for pointing up the, uh, uh, the money to make this event possible. And you've also already seen this slide. But so in this talk, I'm putting my CloudBees hat on. And then talk, and I'd like to talk about sort of you know, the the uh, Jenkins and sort of what Cloud is doing in this space, you know, both in open source and also uh, in the, uh, the product offerings. So in, the, in Cloud Viz, we do a lot of things around and on top of and inside Jenkins. Uh, you know, we write a number of the open source plugins and the core, and as we as we saw earlier today. But um, we have some uh, products for the on-premise Jenkins. Seat. So if you are running your own Jenkins inside of your own hardware, we can help you there. Uh, we have a hosted Jenkins as a service called Debug Cloud. So uh, if you don't, if you'd rather want to focus on things you, you do better and then leave the Jenkins management to ask, then we can help you there. And then I uh, will be talking more about this later. But um, there be we have some technology that sort of blends to bridge these gaps so that you could kind of mix and match what you're trying. So, so that's the, uh, the is my, I guess, my personal sponsor slide. And uh, so today in this talk, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, so um, in, in the context of the capacity of the CTO at CloudBees, I helped a lot of uh, large scale Jenkins deployments that the users are having. And so we start our, our thinking, our approach into how you know, how we recommend people to deploy larger Jenkins installations and manage them has evolved somewhat. And then so today I wanted to cover sort of what we see as like a, the viable way of creating a large resident deployment of Jenkins. Um, and then beyond that, I wanted to sort of deep dive into some of the uh, things that we are working on uh, in some of these product space that we mentioned, like how we bridge the on-premise Jenkins use to our cloud uh, Jenkins capabilities and, you know, they're a little bit more on the chef and puppet tracking. So that's a general idea. Okay, so the first part is, I think, you know, the, when we see Jenkins usage grow inside organizations, there are, roughly speaking, I think, two patterns here. So the one is this, what I call as a vertical Jenkins deployment. You know, so one day, so I guess the, the powers, uh, uh, the power that be, I guess the higher up has decided, okay, so I think we now need to really start thinking about the agile, continuous, stably, that sort of space to improve our efficiency. And they hear that, okay, Jenkins seems to be popular. So uh, you are the one that if you are asked to go research and produce some kind of POC to make sure that your organization could actually start using it. So, you know, as a, as a guy who knows things, you, you know, you, you, you try out these Jenkins. Okay, so it's initially you'd you know, probably run your own instance in some random servers. And while it's small, it kind of nice, works nicely, very quite closely. And then you, from there, you go back and plan ahead. Okay, so, all right, now we have to onboard, say, 50 product teams, and they'd be producing this much load. So you need so many, oh, so many slaves. You probably need a lot of storage. You need a lot of memory to go with too. And eventually, in many places, we've seen this massive scale Jenkins deploy at the massive scale, um, and quite, quite well, reasonably successfully at that. So um, it's not unusual to see the enterprise that has you know, hundreds of slaves connected to one master with you know, the multiple tens of gigabytes of memory allocated to it, and you know, the, a dedicated team of people if we are writing plugin, they're helping product team deploy and that sort of stuff. Um, and in a way, I think this is great. So we've been, help, you know, this uh, it works. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when people get to this stage, I think their main concern becomes the fact that they have all these Jenkins build jobs, all the slaves hooked under one master, and then you know there are only so many things you can do to sort of keep it up and running all the time. And because everything depends on this instance, when it goes back down, uh, I mean, when it goes down, um, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real stress factor. So I, I had some director look me in the eyes that says, okay, my compensation this year is tied to the downtime of the Jenkins. So you better give us like, you know, 99% uptime. And I can only say so much about, oh, okay. Um, so that's the, um, 
So, it, so on one hand, it's great that you know, they are having great success. Obviously, the, for that many product teams to use this stuff, it, uh, I think it's a testament to the usefulness of this thing. But this approach of building this like a, you know, skyscraper, however strong it is, I think is fundamentally challenging. So the, another, I guess, the approach that we see often happens inside large enterprises, it's more like a viral, I don't like this word, but the viral spread of Jenkins. Um, so I guess actually how many of you would consider this is happening in your organization? Right? So you know, the way this typically happens is, I say in, you know, in one floor of in one office somewhere, <laughs> one developer would notice that, okay, so there seems to be this thing called Jenkins, and you know, he's not kept busy enough with day job, so um, he go ahead and install it on one of his computers. And then it's a small instance, and it works nicely, and then he show it to his teammates, and they start using it. So, you know, he got to this nice little cottage deployed in the lakeshore. It's the, his Jenkins instance, and, you know, things are working fine because not much workload is going on. He can install whatever he wants. If he wants to change the plugin, go right ahead and do it. If it goes down, it's not a big deal. And then the next thing you know, that the next team that's working with him would notice that he got this Jenkins instance, and, oh, well, that kind of did, looks nice, and you know, it does certain things. The guy is obviously very proud that this is helping him, so he would go talk about how useful it is, and then, you know, the, as a fellow developer, they get convinced that, yeah, it does sound useful, um, and then so they go on to deploy their own little Jenkins. So, you know, they, they want another house. They like this view in the lakeshore. They want to deploy another house, so it's their Jenkins instance. Um, and then pretty soon what you discover is that uh, everyone is, is, is running their own little Jenkins instance. They're all perfectly happy. Um, you know, it does what it does, and you know, the guy who is in charge of this instance can do everything he needs, as there is no single point of failure, and it's great. But, I mean, it's great from the point of the developer. I mean, this is more or less what was happening to me when I started writing what became Jenkins. Um, but at the same time, if you think of this from the organizational point of view, everyone, you know, they be acting as a little carpenter to build their own house is, is not exactly the most efficient way of going about it. There are certain benefits in doing things in scale. Um, so, you know, aforementioned the single Jenkins master is you know, hundreds of slaves. You can manage these things with like, you know, the 0.5 person or one person. Whereas if you're talking about this, you need collectively a lot of resources to go with it. Another place where you lose, I guess, the efficiency is, let's say, on the hardware utilization. So, um, you know, the, when, say, three teams, the, when the development team has their own Jenkins instance, and when the operations team has their own Jenkins instance, and when the QA team has their own instance, what ends up happening, and this actually also happened at Sun, is that these teams actually belong to a different reporting chain with different budgets. So the QA team decided that, okay, so this is a once uh, in your year opportunity. To, so this is the only time in the current uh, the fiscal year where we could purchase more hardware. So they would like go ahead and buy like a hundred thousand dollar worth of the testing equipment, and it really only gets fully really utilized like you know two weeks before the release, which only happens like a couple of times a year. The rest of the time they more or less sit idle, not doing anything. And at the same time, the developers you know are also you know have their own instance. That's basically me, and I don't have, really have any budget, and they don't really get that testing. Like testing is a Serious thing, so I have to go hunt around like a machine that's lying around to create this silly cluster when there are lots of idle machines in the QA that's sitting idle. So this kind of things obviously is not good for the bottom line of the company. And you know, you know what happened to some microsystems. I don't exactly blame Jenkins Slaves for the failure of the Sun, <laughs> but um, but um, you know, it's it's a contributing factor, right? So. So that's, um, it's, again, it's from the organizational point of view, having this incredible sort of distributedness is not always a good thing. That's, that's what I'm trying to get to. Um, another, I guess, the problem is the, uh, the, how everyone running their own instance is that the things don't really get to done, be done in uniformly, or people reinvent the a whole lot of times. So, you know, the operation people, they are always like a very conscious of the security. So, you know, these people would set up the security set up in such a way that it's almost like a Bruce Lee is protecting their instance. So no malicious instance could, no, no malicious activity could happen without someone auditing the record. And then in, in Jenkins, you can do that sort of things. 
But you know, the developers are a lot more like a really nearly hippie, happy people. So what happens is like, okay, so they rely on what I call as a puppy security, in which if somebody walks around, okay, so how is this security setup going on? He seems to be able to fork off arbitrary processes on the arbitrary server, so you better be keeping track of record, right? And so the kids show the puppy picture, and, oh, that's a cute puppy. Uh, what were you talking again? Okay, I think we are good here. <laughs> right? so, um, so obviously, so it's good in some ways, but again, from the organizational point of view, you'd rather see the Bruce Lee level of security protection on all the instances without the developer actually doing all the work by himself. Um, and the third problem uh, of the Jenkins sprawl is like, uh, you know, when everyone starts to run their own Jenkins instances, it's pretty get, it gets pretty quickly confusing as to where, like, uh, which Jenkins instance is hosting what jobs. And now I'm getting that the, uh, now the, uh, Steve is telling me that the, my test that I committed is fading. Now which Jenkins instance was I supposed to go into? There's all sorts of confusions like that. And it doesn't really help that the Jenkins look exactly alike in every place. Right? So um, again, these things tend to add to the confusion. And then in the end, what happens is that the, the, the poor people, they're, they're, you know, the precious few people who really know is Jenkins end up helping all these individual deployment and their time gets wasted instead of being spent on something more productive. So I guess these are like the two dimensions of the challenges we see. The one is that the, you know, this like a skyscraper approach of single instance that does everything, has one set of program. The other approach of having everyone having their own little instances, having their own set of problems. So, you know, we, we've seen seeing this pattern unfold, uh, you know, so many times. And so eventually we decided that, okay, this is actually something we could help people succeed. And then this became, eventually became the, uh, a product from CloudBees called the uh, Jenkins Operation Center by CloudBees. And because this name is mouthful, uh, we started calling it Jockey or JOC. So I'll probably mention the term JOC or the Jockey. And then what I mean is Jenkins Operation Center by CloudBees. I, um, so, there's a number of things it does. One of the things it does is the, uh, the jockey is capable of letting you share the resources. And when I say resources, that's a nice word for the slave. Um, so you can hook up the set of slaves on the jockey, and then jockey will be capable of letting the connect a Jenkins master site there use them. So you don't have to have individual pool or build slaves on every master to get this going. Um, another thing it does is you could centralize the security setting. So often, you know, probably many of you are using Active Directory or corporate identity database in the back end. And so your standard setup is that you want to integrate your Jenkins to the authentication with that in the back end. So that kind of security settings, you can do it in one place in JLC, in Jockey, and then uh, force automatically deploy that to the all the connected masters. And then for the users of Jenkins, the um, jockey also acts as a sort of like a directory of all the Jenkins instances in your organizations. So you can provide sort of like a dashboard kind of view that shows you exactly where your Jenkins instances are and then provide a single navigation to it. So to, to see uh, this notion of sharing slaves needs a little bit of explanation because it's kind of unique concept here. So let's say we are talking about like a three Jenkins instances you know, the one, that, one that's owned by the QA team, another one that's owned by the engineering team, and the third one owned by the operations team. So these are you know, three things running on three different machines, maybe uh, ma even managed and administered by three different people. And since these are Jenkins masters, you can obviously connect slaves under it. So maybe let's say in this, uh, this, in this setup, uh, we had two slaves already hooked up to the operation team. So again, sometimes it, makes, it just makes sense for the individual team to own certain set of machines that's specifically configured to do whatever the team needs to do. But also at the same time, oftentimes there are like a somewhat canonical uniform environment that the, much of the uh, rest of the development would happen. So for us, for example, um, the, you know, the much of the builds that the cloud bees do internally would, would be a, like a Jenkins plugin compilation running unit test on those. So the, for those, we obviously only need like a run of the mule Linux slaves. So in those circumstances, if you have a J Jenkins operation center server, Jockey server, and if you configure these slaves, the pool of slaves in here, and then um, the, these, 
Jenkins instance gets, whenever the build needs to happen here, it realizes that it doesn't have any slaves, and there's no place to do the build, and it goes on to talk to Jockey and get one machine allocated, only for the duration of the build. And then, um, you know, this happens to all the connected masters, and then when the build is over, these slaves go back into the uh, Jockey pool again, so that you can be, uh, so that they can be then leased back into somebody else's if need be. And uh, the security settings, you know, you do that configuration on, on Jockey, and then you could then, uh, with the, you know, with the configure, with a suitable configuration, you could then force this setup into participating masters. So this allows you to create this like a layered administration hierarchy. So you could have a, you know, the each administrator that has some additional power on the individual Jenkins masters, but as a super user of the entire cluster, you have a bigger control and then you can disable certain parts, like security settings, uh, uh, on these instances so that the instance masters won't be able to do anything about them. So that's the kind of the, the scheme, and I hope now you're sort of getting, uh, and seeing where I'm trying to get to here. The idea, so this, I think the pattern that we are sort of, I think seems workable in more places is this idea that Okay, so you, you don't want to have just one massive instance. You don't want to have like too many instances either, but you do need to be able to have a few. And when you have a several instances, you better need to be able to connect these guys. So that's um, the, the role of the connecting these things and controlling them. That's what the, uh, the jockey acts in the middle. So this is sort of like, a, the, the picture is a little bit busy and I apologize, but um, this is the one of the canonical setup for the jockey deployment. So as an enterprise central team, the first thing is like if you focus on this part, um, you deploy jockey. So the jockey is basically just Jenkins with a few more different plugins. So you did it, I I'll show you later, but it does look and feel like Jenkins. Um, so deploy, you know how to deploy these guys. You can install Debian packages or RPM. Um, and then if you prefer, you can make this in the HA configuration. Um, so that if the one node goes down for some reason, the other would take over immediately. And then uh, they have to be storing, they, they would store things into the Jenkins home directory, again, like uh, what typical Jenkins would do. So that's your sort of like a central JOC instance. I'll come back to these guys uh, later. Actually, uh, then, then uh, yeah, so you do probably do a security setup and so on. And then now when it comes time to onboard, uh, say a product team that uh, needs it's on Jenkins instance, and what we do is you, you install the uh, Jenkins Enterprise. This is, uh, uh, you know, in, in somewhere. You can again create the HA configuration if you so prefer. Um, and then so again, since this is a regular Jenkins instance, you can these guys can, can come with a pre-configured set of uh, slaves or something like that. And then finally, you'd hook this up into Jockey. And then, so that allows Jockey to control, take over some of the management aspect. That allows this guy to lease a new slave and stuff like that. So this process of deploying one sort of, you know, the Jenkins Enterprise for a team can be then repeated over and over again as many times as necessary. So if you need to bring in another QA team, uh, you can do that by just deploying this and then connecting it up, and you can very easily see yourself uh, you know, getting a quite number of masters. And since each of the masters could carry out substantial build, you, know, you're, um, you can really sort of see how this would scale quite well. And the last piece of the picture here that I wanted to talk about uh, is the, uh, the test environment. So you know, as more and more te te teams rely on these Jenkins instances to run their operations, it kind of becomes important that you be able to test out the new plugins or the upgrade or stuff like that in a separate uh, test environment. So you can deploy another Jenkins instance exactly the same way, but this guy you'd use to you know, play with, experiment with new stuff. And only when you're happy, uh, you could then sort of capture that settings and then you could create the custom update center on Jenkins operation center. And then that lists only the list plugins that you want to use and their versions in here. And then uh, all these participating Jenkins master, it only see the plugin that's advertised from this update center. So it allows you to create a great uniformity in your environment. So you don't have to worry about, okay, this instance is using this version. So this seems to be hitting this problem that I think we've already uh, solved in other places. So 
Yeah, so that's a general idea. Instead of having like one skyscraper or like a tons of tiny cottage, we want to create like a, you know, the handful of the, uh, the significant instances that are interconnected. So I think it's much more robust in the sense that the, um, you know, the, you're really not pushing any individual instances to its limit. And or even it, when one instance goes down, the other three are still up and running. So you're only like, you're only crippling a part of the uh, entire organization. So you'd have a lot less stress free, like, like a lot less stressful life in this way. I think it's what we are trying to do. So, um, so that's basically, uh, so the talk is cheap. So let's see how this would actually work. Let me show you how this would work. So, um, so I have a demo set up here and then I'm looking at the uh, Jenkins Operation Center console. So I've already have security enabled. So let me log in as the someone. So what you're seeing here is the, uh, the top page of the jockey. And, and as you can see, this feels very much like Jenkins for better or worse. Um, and uh, so you feel right at home. So there's one Jenkins instance in here that's connected, actually not quite connected, but ready to be connected. So I have a, a participating Jenkins instance running in another, uh, another actually jockey, jockey local. Uh, I didn't realize how painful it is to look at this and type this way. Um, so, so, so this is a new instance of Jenkins Enterprise. So what I want to do is to paste this connection detail. So this basically encodes how JE uh, Jenkins Enterprise would talk to the jockey. So all I have to do is to cut and paste it in, and then this would hook up the uh, Jenkins instance back into the operation center. So that's so they are so they are there. Um, so now it's ready to do the action. So first, um, the one thing I wanted to call attention to is if you look at the breadcrumb, it sort of tried to create this, this illusion or the impression that these Jenkins, individual Jenkins instances are just acting as like a, almost like a hierarchical structure as under a jockey. So the whole thing, however many Jenkins masters you have, the whole thing kind of looks like a single logically coherent Jenkins instance, uh, even though they're actually running in different places. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's, that's how it's done here. And uh, the, now if you go to this Jenkins instance, so the, this individual Jenkins enterprise, they are actually running in the uh, highly available configuration. So if you go see the um, manage uh, high ability status page, you see that, um, well, it's actually having, having one instance, I guess I failed to update the demo. But if you have a secondary instance, you see them appearing here. And then obviously the whole, the, you know, the jockey is HA aware. So when the fade over happens on the participating masters, they would be able to connect back all right. Um, and then these Jenkins instances you can create. Um, so one of the plugins, so the, much of these features, by the way, I'm showing actually comes from the, Jen, the plugins in Jenkins Enterprise. So one of these is the uh, like ability to do the backup. So this is actually, jo this job on Jenkins is, this, uh, is configured to take a backup of, um, of this Jenkins instance. So I'd specify, okay, so in this case, I really only want to store the critical part of the information that is the system configuration and job configuration. So these are obviously necessary to restore the state. But I'm willing to forego the build records. So they, these are bulky. So in terms of me being able to produce or back up in a smaller size and more efficiently, I'm for now the living, living this out. And uh, I'm creating the backup into the local directory, whereas in production deployment, you probably want to store this artifact remotely. Um, and then you know, this being a job means you can very easily use the existing scheduler capabilities and so on. So I'm t making this, uh, um, I'm configuring this job to run hourly. So if we schedule the new guy, Immediately, it will start creating backup, um, I guess, when the next build is available. So, okay, thank you. No. Uh, yes, so, so that's there. Um, another thing I wanted to show is the use of the folders. Um, oh, something, it's, it's, looks like it's clogging up a little. 
Uh, the, so in, even inside the individual Jenkins instance, it's useful to be able to create smaller subsections of the instance so that uh, different teams don't end up stepping onto each other's toes. So we use that by using folder plugin. So this is actually an open source plugin that you can install on any, anywhere. And so when I look at the particular uh, folder, you see that there's a number of jobs defined here. If I look at another folder, um, there's another set of jobs defined here. And in this way, um, you know, the people can create their own views and then they can mess around. They can do this part of the instance in whatever way they want without uh, affecting other people. So that's, um, that's the, about the folders. And the here, um, we also, in this Jenkins instance, we have a few uh, slaves that's pre-configured. So there's, I think, a couple of these guys that's configured to run a, uh, oh, they went offline, so which means they are probably getting leased. Oh, oh, I see, I know why. Okay, so see, okay. So it's fading, it's thinking, it's trying to be very friendly, telling me that there's not enough disk space, so it stopped building. Um, but I don't want that. So I'm going to disable that and then bring them back up again. Uh, bring this node back online. And I want to have this guy back online again. And then finally, add a master online again. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, so you can obviously define a number of slaves. Oh, it's still doing monitoring. I'm sorry. All right, please swap space. No monitoring, please. Okay, so, um, so you can create a number of local slaves um, like you normally do today, but um, the, uh, perhaps the more interesting part is to actually get the slave at uh, least for, uh, to be built. So um, if I run some build actually here, I think this guy would be good. So this job is configured to run on a certain level. Let me make the font bigger again. So this job is configured to run on this shared level, which is actually not available on any local slaves. But it's sort of on its con there is a number of slaves configured to have this level on Jockey. So what has happened is oh, it happened too fast. So let me let me do it again. So what happens is um, if you look at this left hand side, you see that this, so because I submitted this job in the queue, uh, the, the, this Jenkins decided that it needs to grab a new node from Jockey, and then it will get one. Um, when it becomes available and it should start building. Um, and maybe I'm putting it on the spot too much because it's not doing that. All right, here it comes. So there's a, a slave that, that was borrowed from the jockey and then now it's doing the build. And when it's over, it will disappear. So it's sort of like a, from the point of view of these masters, it looks and feels like you have an elastic environment that's capable of performing the builds. All right, so the build is done, so in pretty, okay, so now the slave is gone, so you get the idea. Um, and then, so a little bit about the, I also mentioned about the update center. Um, so that, for example, is defined here. So again, you can create a new update center by, like, just like how you create a new job. So I scroll down a little bit here, and then you have the option, the ability to create a new update center. So I've already created one here. So what you can do, for example, is if you configure the, um, the proper upstream, so most of the time I'd imagine people want to start off from the OSS update center and then pick up some baseline, uh, that as a baseline. And, um, or you can also upload your own plugin by uh, selecting whatever plugin you want. Uh, maybe I have some plugin that I could upload. Um, or maybe I don't. So yeah, if you upload your plugin, so in lots of enterprise build their own plugins to you know, integrate with their own tools. So you can do that and you could distribute that into participating masters relatively easily. Um, and uh, another part that I want to show is the access control. So the, uh, one of the features in the Jockey and JE, uh, Jenkins Enterprise, is the role-based access control, which allows you to create a lot more fine-grained setup for the security. So the main idea, there's a couple of concepts in the, the role-based access control, aka RBAC. So the one of those is that you first have to define several roles. So in this instance, I got the three roles defined. The one is administer. So this role is basically like a super user that's capable of doing everything. And you see that he has a long list of permissions. 
The second role is the read-only role, browser role, so that he can, this, this person won't be able to do any mutation, but at least he can modify, uh, I'm sorry, at least he can look at the test report, download the artifact, that, that sort of things. And then finally, we have a developer role, so this guy can create jobs and configure those and things like that, but he cannot install new plugins, uh, he cannot um, uh, the restart Jenkins, so in that sense, it's somewhat limited. So now that we have these roles defined, uh, we can create some groups and assign these roles to some specific people. So um, you, you notice that I'm logging in as a heartbreak, so I put him in the administrator role. The developer roles is, uh, is, uh, is the mapping to the developer X group in LDAP. Um, so this includes people like Jesse and me. Um, and then the browser aspect is like a somebody else. It's basically what is happening. So um, the, in particular, what I wanted to highlight is this ability to, so, well, I'm sorry, with this setup at the arbitrary level, so let's say on this Jenkins instance level, I could create like who gets what access. I'm not really configuring anything in here, so it's just basically inherit from the parent. But here, for example, interestingly, I can create the secret project folder. So let's say in this place, I'm not, I don't want anyone else but specifically designated people involved in this project to be able to see it because it's a secret. So I can create that kind of setup by going into the, actually going into the role and uh, demand, uh, demand from the future section that um, these roles, like a developer roles and browser role, normally they inherit, but in this, on this particular folder specifically, I want them to be explicitly assigned before the permission is granted. So um, what the end result is that the Kosuke, if you log in as a Kosuke, um, if you log in as a Kosuke, um, now I go to Jenkins A because I'm a lowly developer, I won't see the secret project page, uh, the folder. So that's the kind of idea. And also, I forgot to mention, but um, you know, I only logged in one place, Jockey, and then the, but when I go to these participating Jenkins instances, it automatically signs me, so there's a single sign-on across the entire system, so that you log into one place and it automatically carry over to all sorts of other places. So that's the, uh, so the quickly what I wanted to show here, I think. Um, so now if I go back to, go back to, Demo. Yeah, so I, I touched a few of the plugins in JE, like uh, the, you know, the role-based access control and uh, the custom update center and so on. There's a tons more that obviously I didn't have time to. And then there are a few that we, we just released a new version of this, the, uh, I think the last month. And, and uh, so one of the new features that, that uh, is quite useful is this NIO SSH slaves. Uh, which allows you to connect lots of SSH slaves by using NIO, so you get the, the speed gain. Oh, and I forgot to show you one other thing. This is actually pretty cool, so I have to, um, even though I really should, I don't have time to show this, I should be, sh I, uh, I want to show it to you, uh, which is um, if my, is this, uh, the monitoring functionality. So we built this um, ability to monitor the connected Jenkins instances. So it's showing, for example, the system load applied to various connected Jenkins instances. And it's, going out, it's only gonna show you like the top five most busy instances. So if you have, even if you have like a two dozen instances, it don't, doesn't get too busy. Um, and then so it provides some kind of like a monitoring insight into your system. And uh, part of this information is operation centric, but the other is useful for planning. Like you could see the number of executors in the system and how many are in use or, you know, what's the, uh, how many views are coming into the queue at the what percentage? And so there's a lot of useful insights. Um, and then for these operational metrics, you could actually also hook this up to the uh, alerting. So you could say if the, um, the heap usage goes above 95%, you could tell Jenkins Operation Center to fire you an email and things like that. So um, I think it's handy for places that uh, you'd use this. And it's, we also released a new version of Jenkins Operations Center uh, a few days back. So this version contains the monitoring that I just showed you, as well as the ability to connect the JNLP slaves and create a cloud out of it. So in the JNLP cloud in particular, you could connect a lot of identical Jenkins slaves into single configuration and create a big pool of them so that you don't have to individually configure them one by one. 
Okay, so um, I only have 10 minutes, so I did have to hurry up here. Now I'm changing gear a little bit and talking about the Debug Cloud, which is our hosted Jenkins as a service. So, um, so one of the challenges in Debug Cloud, I think, is that we wanted to provide the kind of experience that you get in the, your, like your on-premise Jenkins instances. So we, needed, we felt the need to bridge the gap. So over the time, we've been building up these various ways to connect the hosted Jenkins instances back to your Jenkins uh, the build. I mean, so your build slave. So for example, with on-premise executors, you could run slaves on your internet, on your corporate firewall, and then connect them up into our uh, hosted Jenkins. Or you could have the, the builds that's happening on the cloud to talk back into your corporate network by using a VPN gateway. Um, so this would allow you to check out the source code from the code, source code repository inside the uh, firewall, that sort of things. And the most recent addition to this sort of like a hybrid approach uh, is the, uh, the cloud bursting. So this is, what this allows you to do is, uh, we've been building this awesome ability to run lots of isolated builds in the cloud at quite a large scale in the elasticity. So we are bringing that technology into your Jenkins instance that you're hosting on your own, on, you know, your own computer. So this is a free plugin that you could install, and then um, you know, whenever the Jenkins would feel the need to be spill off the build into the cloud, it will talk through the internet and over the internet into our environment and to grab a new slave uh, that's only for you, and then you do the build, and at the end of the build, the slave would disappear, but in a way that captured the warm workspace and so on. So it's actually still quite efficient in terms of number of getting number of repeated builds going. And you only have to pay this by the minute, actual the actual minute you use for the build, so it's a great way of spinning over. And then, uh, and partly because the technology we built to host these slaves inside the cloud is kind of like a very close to my heart, I wanted to um, talk a lot more about that, but it uh, looks like I'm not getting time out of it, so I'm just gonna mention that internally we call it uh, a mansion, you know, we want the slaves to be building a nice to be living in a nice place, uh, I guess uh, we call it the uh, mansion. And internally, it's using the container technology to isolate the builds or the, um, for OSX builds, we use the QMU to run the isolated OSX instances. So yeah, so this is actually one of the, the another value add here that you could actually run the OSX build on the cloud by, by using our services. And there's a lot of strange level innovations that put into here based on ZFS uh, that allows you to keep the workspace, that they got, you know, partial workspace, so that you don't have to clone the entire repository over and over. Okay, so now the last leg of the part uh, that I wanted to talk about is this uh, traceability that I mentioned. So I touched up on this a uh, little in the morning, but um, let me, so, uh, not, so let me try this again a little bit. So, you know, so you're in this continuous stable kind of environment and you're pre you are creating, say, multiple dozens of the binaries every single day, any one of which could go into the staging environment or could go into the production. So in this kind of setup, you really need to have a lot of the traceability into what binary is deployed where, and then where does that come from, what changes it contains, what it doesn't, whether it's tested, who is approved it, and that sort of things. So this, the like Chef and Puppet traceability feature is built around this idea is, okay, so what can we do to improve this kind of forensic analysis? If you have uh, like a production build that went down, you need to write some post-mortem analysis. So like how do you know that where the change crept in? How did it, so that's what we are trying to solve. So you know, so you're having, say, let's say you deploy a chef, right? So you're producing salad. All the ingredients would come in from the left, you know, or the, uh, I guess, the lettuce and some uh, leafy ve vegetables. And then the people would, I guess, uh, partly with the help of automation, partly manually, you put together the thing and from the right-hand side, the salad is shipped out. And, um, and then it sort of gets into the customer's mouth but um, you, know, you unfortunately discover that there are some unsavory ingredients in here that end up killing customers. Okay, so okay, we don't do that bad, all right? So it's not that bad, but uh, so you, can, you get the point. So, all right, so now you got this, you know, the, the evidence of a crime. Now, how do you know where you come from? Like, what, how, what do you know about this that you can use for the information toward the future? So, um, this job is made hard because, again, like I said earlier in the keynote, um, 
normally it involves two sets of people uh, that sort of be responsible for different, uh, they are responsible for different aspects of the, um, of this environment. So um, you need, you want to be able to, so as a developer who is producing binaries, you want to be able to track where, when these files have been deployed to the production servers, and then you want to track them back, and then that's what it does. So that's what we do in this chef and puppet tracking feature. So I want to demo this, um, and then for that, I need to switch to a different Docker container. Um, so for that, I'm going to run, I have a couple of services running here. The one, so in this demo setup, so I got the uh, one Jenkins instance running, um, which is building the, uh, you know, let's pretend that we are just building some quick web apps. And uh, what this does is after the end of the build, they push the result into Artifactory, so which is a you know, repository manager. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really matter uh, where your eventual result shifts. The point is that it, Leaves Jenkins is a part of the idea. So there is nothing particularly interesting about this configuration that, uh, you know, it checks out the code and the Hello World source code repository, do some Maven build to install the web app, I'm sorry, to build the web app, and then finally we deploy that into the Artifactory. So if now we go see the local Artifactory page, um, so you'll see that the, uh, the binary that we just deployed is in here. Um, so this is the binary that we are producing. Um, so again, imagine, because this is a continuous deployment environment and we're producing a lot of binaries, we are doing what they may have been called as a snapshot deployment. So this gets constantly being overwritten by the whatever build that's coming in. And then finally, um, I have a puppet manifest. So there, this is, um, so let me see if I could move this window over. Uh, into here. Oh. So, um, yes, yeah, so I have a puppet manifest here. So now let's pretend that I'm the, we are the operation guys, and there's a the trivial uh, the um, puppet manifest here that deploy that takes uses wget to get this artifact snapshot artifact from the uh, Artifactory and then deploy that into Tomcat so that like, it, you know, it, gets, it gets going. So if this is just, this might be like a reasonable setup for the, say staging environment where you do want to be testing the latest thing. So now, the, but because this is happening, so this Puppet would be running on its own schedule like Cron or by, by through the Puppet Enterprise. So Jenkins wouldn't really know at any given point in time when Puppet would, uh, when Puppet has deployed what binary, which is the problem. So um, just to, to sort of bring the demo to the whole circle, so this is the Tomcat in question, and I think the web app is running here, uh, or maybe not. Um, oh yeah, because I haven't deployed it. So let's, <laughs> let's run the uh, Puppet to deploy this guy. So um, I'm using a so Puppet apply to deploy this app, and if you, uh, what? Um, could not, oh, because I need to run this as root, I guess, because it's puppet once. Oh, but then, uh, yeah, all right, so let's see. Apologies. Well, nothing like demo fading in the production. Uh, yeah, so now, okay, so now we deployed it. So um, if you go back into the, this page, then you should see the uh, web app being deployed. So. Um, so if you, the, so this trick, the, um, so now we are, we are trying to get this information back into Jenkins, and then the trick to do that is actually entirely in the command line of how we launch Puppet. So the Puppet has the ability to send the report into various systems, so we are using the built-in report handler and then send the result back into Jenkins. So with this, what happens is like, you know, this output, if you look at it, it shows you that the Puppet is telling us that it has deploy the xyz.war, it has you know, copied this file into locally and that has this MD5 checksum, which turned out to be the fingerprints that we are, we are monitoring, we are using inside Jenkins to track them. So now if you go back to um, the web app, build one, 
uh, you see that it's getting a little star here. And what that means is because I configured the promotion saying that the, this build is now deployed on this instance. So, it's, uh, so now you can see in the fingerprint information page that uh, it's been produced about four minutes ago because I clicked the build button back then and then it's deployed. So it took me about two minutes for this change to propagate. Um, and then, so it's giving me a strange host name because the test is running inside Docker. But you get the idea that uh, this could be useful in providing information. So, you know, in, in the realistic environment, you'll be running, the build will be going on all the time. So there will be new builds coming every so often. Um, and um, the Puppet run would probably come in a little bit more slowly. So um, now I think if I'm done with build three, probably by the time I run the deployment again, uh, it's probably deploying build three. So now let's see, go back and see which one it actually deployed. Um, so you can see that, yeah, the build three has been deployed. Um, and then when we look at its fingerprint, it can even tell me that prior to deploying this version, it was running build one. So you know which version you need to roll back to. So that's the kind of the idea. Um, so, um, okay, I'm running out of time here. Uh, the, the, the last bit, okay, this is a real last bit is, um, in the, uh, the, so now that the Jenkins knows when things are deployed, we could, for example, configure more automations. So here I set up another smoke test job. The idea is that if this web app is deployed on the production, um, then I want to run this, like, uh, the smoke test job to make sure things are working okay. So you could imagine that that kind of thing should even expand the domain of automation. And, uh, you know, so in particular, with conjunction with workflow and things like that. All right, so, um, so in the, I think just the, the last slide here. So I think there's a lot of stuff that we'd be building. You know, if you're an enterprise kind of user, so I hope some of the JE jockey functionality or the way we think the more resilient deployment should go in, evolve into is useful. If you're more cutting edge guys in the more of a early adapter open source guys, then I think some of this workflow functionality and the traceability feature that I showed you probably should be something that gets you excited. So that's all I wanted to cover today. Um, thank you very much.